pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Verification of notice. The meeting was properly published and noticed. Okay, we've got with us tonight uh, Devin Flanagan from Keller. He's going to make a presentation on the proposed expansion at the fire EMS station. So, Devin, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. I'll turn some of those. Jimmy, can you turn those lights sure. up? Sure. As Gene said, my name is Devin Flanagan. I'm with Keller. Uh, we're architect and construction company. Uh, the goal of tonight is to help educate the public on what has been done so far, where we're at in the process, and the road ahead for the Cambridge Fire and EMS facility. Um, this is a, probably a four-minute four video about the existing facility, and then I'm going to go through a probably 20-minute presentation about, again, all the details. So we'll go through this first, and then we'll have the presentation. Always up against time. Minutes, even seconds matter. Since we're in a rural Same. area with a lot more miles to cover, saving time is even more critical. Our department is here to help more than 7,000 people in 365 days a year. From our station here in downtown Cambridge on Main Street, we cover all of Cambridge. Rockdale, Christiana, Oakland, and Lake Mills. We also assist other communities under mutual aid contracts at Vision. In a rural area that big, we need every second to count when we get the call. As our communities grow, so do the needs of emergency services. There is one thing that is not growing importantly, our station. Our daily operational needs have simply outgrown our existing space. Presently, we have our EMTs in a resident across the street, across Highway 12. And when they have a busy call, they have to cross that street to get to the station. With every second counting, it's important we have facilities that will address that. Firefighters are dying here close to trucks that are leaving on calls. For some calls, we have to get equipment from another building before we can go. That takes precious time. Our offices and common areas are just too small to function efficiently, and that wastes time. Together, all this makes recruiting experienced first responders a challenge. To make matters worse, over the last three years, incident volume, traumatic injuries, and cardiovascular calls went up. So the Cambridge Fire EMS station was built in the early 80s, and things have changed dramatically. Our communities are larger, the demand on our services for trauma and for illnesses has increased incredibly. So we need to move this, this station into the 21st century. And when you're spending the kind of money that it's going to take to do that, you want to make sure you do it right. The new station will have living quarters for EMS and firefighters. It will have a bigger apparatus bay to handle the current and future changes to first responder equipment. More office, meeting, and training space will finally allow us to have efficiently do all of our work when we are not on calls. A new workout area, which is common in EMS and fire stations, will help our staff stay physically and mentally sharp. This is where we work out now. Kind of scary. We can save time and be more efficient. We can do better for more people.
So what we'll talk about, real briefly, a little bit about Keller for those who don't know, uh, talking about your project, why are we here, uh, what are we accomplishing, and some of the goals that have been put before us, some of the solutions that we came up with, um, talking about construction management, the process that lays ahead, budgeting, and then we'll wrap it up with the timeline. Keller. Um, for those who don't know, we have offices throughout the state, about 260 employees, been in business 60 years. So for this project, like every project, we assemble an entire team to that project. Myself, project manager, we've got Rob, architect, interior designer, um, we've got an entire division of estimators who work at Keller, supervisor, safety director, and there's plenty of others behind the doors. This is just briefly, so a little bit about what Keller does. We're primarily a design-build firm. So we do construction all over Wisconsin, but the division that I'm in works on specifically municipal projects. So fire stations, police stations, school districts, anything with public funds is right in our division. Some projects that we've been a part of. Uh, City of Fort Atkinson currently under construction. We are building that. Uh, it started in April of 2020. Uh, 23,000 square feet fire and EMS station. Iron Ridge is a fire volunteer station, fire station only. Um, that was done a couple years ago. Cascade is a volunteer fire station, about 12,000 square feet. That one broke ground April of this year. City of Toma, that is a fire EMS fully staffed city station. That's currently under in design, it's 35,000 square feet. Bailey's Harbor up in uh, Sturgeon Bay, that one broke ground in April of this year. It's about 15,000 square foot fire station only, volunteer. We've got the Bug, this is station number one. Uh, fire and EMS, 18,000 square feet. That was done about two years ago. Bug North Station, so this is their second station for that district. This was a small expansion and remodel. Town of Freedom is a fire and EMS station for a small township in a rural community. That one broke ground in June of this year. So we do a handful of stations. Um, it's something that we pride ourselves on. We've got a lot more in the, in the works. So now the exciting part, your project. When we look at the building, uh, this is the current station. So right here would be the apparatus bay. This area would be the meeting space. And now in, we're in the apparatus bay of the EMS. Currently, there are two buildings on a parcel next door, which was purchased. So the idea would be to try to utilize this site and possibly expand into that other parcel. So those were the preliminary thoughts early on. With every project, we have goals that are set up before us, and we really stick to those goals to make sure that we stay uh, that we accomplish the things that were set out for originally. So with this, how do, can we create a solution to solve the problem of our current aging facility in the most economical manner? That was brought by the Fire and EMS Commission to us, myself and the architect and the team, when we look at this building. Um, think of it as what we go back to when we look at making decisions, when we look at designs, when we look at things. Uh, we want to stick to those core values and that mission for the project itself. Aging facility. So why are we here and why are we doing it? That's for those who aren't there every day and those who haven't been through the station in years. Um, this helps understand what we're up against. So currently, uh, the building was built in 1984. Some of the current... Uh, current concerns, not all of them, but these are the major ones that are really driving all of this. Um, turnout gear, currently, currently the turnout gear is located in the apparatus bay. Why that is not good? Well, in the past 10 years-ish, 
Uh, there's been a lot of studies on fire departments, volunteers, as well as staff. And it's come to find out that the carcinogens that are in the apparatus base, so those carcinogens that are brought off by the exhaust and by other things in the apparatus bay, stick to those clothes. Well, fire, de fire departments have found out that a lot of volunteers and staff and any of those individuals have come back with cancer. It's been absolutely deadly, and they've um, found that that is one of the driving factors for this. So the turnout gear is located just in the general apparatus bay. There is no ventilation. There is no, um, there's nothing to hold it tight, and there's nothing to pull those carcinogens out when it's sitting there. Currently, as it was mentioned in the video before, uh, living quarters are non-existent on the site or in the building. So it's actually across the road. So when there's a call, people are running out of an apartment to the station to then leave on a call. Ventilation, when we look at that turnout gear and other rooms in the facility, uh, we kind of go to an FPA, which is uh, fire and EMS standards, more or less, and there's almost no ventilation. Now, in 1984, a lot of these things weren't known. So in 1984, they built this station the best they could with the knowledge that they had, and I think they did a great job. Well, fast forward almost 40 years, um, there's a lot of things that have changed and a lot of information that we know now that we can implement. Ventilation is one of those things that is absolutely critical for the safety of those individuals who are utilizing the facility on a day-to-day -day basis. Overall, their long-term safety is really dependent upon that. Environmental, um, as far as materials that we have in the existing station, longevity, space constraints, um, as you had saw, we do a lot of stations. Um, when I look at this station compared to other stations, I would say it's fairly similar to other old um, rural stations that have had almost no work done to them since the 50s to the 80s. Um, there is space constraints in the offices, the apparatus bay, there's no turnout gear room. There is minimal uh, meeting room space. There's no training room space. Again, in 1984, it was built really well, and it served the needs of the community at that time. But now things have changed so dramatically that it just doesn't cut it anymore in any of these spaces. So we're really, really um, crammed for space. And not only is it a... Um, staff problem, but when we look in the apparatus bay, when we have those vehicles so close to one another and people are putting on boots and jackets in the apparatus bay, every department has the same fear of a truck leaving and one of the hooks or something on the truck pulling one of those people because everything is jammed so tight in that apparatus bay. This building would have a generator for it to be an EOC, so it's Emergency Operations Center. Um, if there was a catastrophe, this would be a facility that could be utilized by the community for those needs. Overall safety, I would say this and the space constraints, and they're di um, directly related, are the biggest ones. Uh, those volunteers and those individuals who are working for the fire and EMS, keeping them safe, I think, is critical, not only to this community, but every community, to make sure that they're staying safe in the long term. Gender, as things um, continue moving into the future, keeping things uh, equal and fair opportunities for everyone and making sure that everything, everyone feels safe in a facility. So those are some but not all of the concerns. Those are the major ones worth diving into. Okay, so... We meet with the department. We find out what the needs are, the concerns, the pitfalls of the current station. What do we do next? Well, the architect sits down and goes through a long interview process of multiple meetings for hours and hours. And it's called a needs assessment. So it dives into individual rooms for the entire facility, as far as the exterior facility, the site, um, every aspect of your project. We go into every individual need. So we're talking if it's an individual office space, 
how many filing cabinets, how big are they, um, how big is the desk going to be, is it going to be a U desk, is it just going to be an L desk, is it going to be a desk in the corner, every individual thing. It ends up being, this one was probably about 50 pages long of information. So the needs assessment, the best way to think of it is it is a document that creates the pieces of the puzzle. All this information are small bits and pieces of information that create the puzzle pieces. Once we get to a plan, that'll be the puzzle completed. But we gotta get the puzzle pieces first. Final breakdown. So when we look at square footages, uh, we've got office space about 5,400, crew quarters about 4,100, um, apparatus bay about 16,000, which brings us to a total station size of approximately 28,800. Now, if we can utilize any of the existing building, that would save approximately 9,800 square feet, which would bring us to a net addition or building addition of right around 19,000 square feet. Goals of the project itself. So as we started earlier, kind of with that mission statement of what we're doing, um, you know, we're trying to solve the problem in the most economical manner. These are the four goals that the Fire and EMS Commission brought before us. One, uh, utilize the existing structure as much as possible. Two, select the most economical man or select the most economical solution. Three, stay on the existing site, and four, stay operational during construction. Now, one or two of those goals alone is pretty challenging. <laughs> um, all four of them is definitely putting us to the test. Um, you want to stay on the existing site. Um, but you don't want to leave the building and you want to stay operational during all of construction. So those are the driving factors of the design. So what? switch us over again. What we'll watch is a 3D animation of the building. So this is what the architect came up with and what our drafters put together to help give everyone a visual of what that building would look like. Just so everyone is somewhat aware, this would be the building addition. This is the current apparatus bay and that would be the current EMS bay.
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So how we got here, um, originally we had um, a couple designs, so there went through a lot of revisions and a lot of planning, um, which led us to this point. Um, to give you context, I think there was probably six months to 12 months of planning um, through going through those revisions. Early on, uh, we eliminated the ground up construction due to cost and um, either department relocation or actual site relocation off to a different parcel. Uh, we reduced the overall size uh, 1,500 square feet from the needs assessment, about 8%. Uh, through staying on the site and with the design, we were able to keep the garage in the back, uh, which then can be utilized as storage. And we are able to reuse the entire existing facility. <coughs> So currently, this is the station, and right in the center, from here up, is the apparatus bay. So from here down is offices, meeting rooms, and right in here is the EMS. I'll walk you through the phasing. The proposed addition would be first constructed. 
In this proposed addition, there would be apparatus bays for both fire and EMS, turnout gear, and some mechanical spaces to, that will allow this addition to be fully functional. Once this was constructed, the apparatus bay would be vacated. Um, all the trucks, all the turnout gear would be re relocated in the addition. Same thing with EMS. So that leaves um, the apparatus of both fire and EMS empty. So that would be phase two. We would remodel those spaces. Again, this is still being utilized for office and um, meeting rooms. Once those two spaces are remodeled, uh, we would have offices and the meeting room in the, uh, in the old apparatus bay, which then would be phase three of vacating the original meeting room and office spaces that are currently used into the newly remodeled which then the last phase three would be the dormitories and a couple other rooms for the facility. This uh, driveway still stays. We would have drive out directly onto the road from the apparatus. And again, for those um, to kind of get your bearings, the uh, building that is existing is approximately here with another building behind there. So this is that parcel stretching that way. Again, this is the existing apparatus. We're not going to go through everything. Down here is the tower. And again, all of this is the office and training, which again, once those trucks move out, this part would be remodeled. And then here we have all the office, the existing offices and training room. And we would move from there for phase three into the offices, which would allow all the new dormitories and a couple other spaces being remodeled in there as well. Apparatus bay, this was the proposed addition. This would fit all of the fire and EMS turnout gear, some uh, decon room, mechanical room, a um, couple office spaces for this side of it. Again, this is an exterior rendering, one similar that we just saw. Construction management. Okay, so now we go through the plans, we bid it out, and now we're looking down the road ahead. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on it, but single source accountability. So Keller would be the architect, construction manager. So we manage the entire project. We don't pound a single nail into the building. So 100% of the project is all bid out. It's complete transparency. All the bids go to the municipalities. It's a public bid opening. And what it does is it allows local contractors an equal and fair opportunity. So since we're managing it, we can take this entire project, rather than just bidding it out to large general contractors, and break it down to excavation, masonry, um, HVAC, plumbing, probably for something like this, 25 to 30 individual bid units. So then Keller would help go through all those bids, verify them, make sure that they're a responsible bidder for the project, and Keller would bond the project. Keller would be at risk, so that means we're financially responsible for contractors who go bankrupt or issues along the way. Just to give you an example of how this works, uh, Town of Freedom, one that we saw earlier, this was bid out in March of this year. It's a 15,000 square foot fire in EMS, and for a project that size, we got 99 bidders. To get a little bit of a close up, so earthwork, we had four bids, asphalt, we had three. So for asphalt, typically very tight numbers because there's not a lot of flexibility. It ranges from 101,000 to 117. We got three landscaping, three fencing, five exterior concrete. That ranges from 59,000 to 90, 91,000. You got those pretty big ranges in there. And it's really driven by the local contractors and how hungry everyone is. The low bids on almost on every but one of these is a local contractor or within probably five to ten minutes of this job site. So it really encourages those local contractors. 
We're going to skip over this. Budgeting. Uh, as I talked about before, we have an entire staff of estimators. It's all they do every day is estimate projects. We go through a comprehensive budgeting plan for municipal projects like this. So we understand exactly where the budget will be when it comes to bid day. When we started out, we looked at industry averages, comparable projects, somewhere in that five and a half to seven and a half million. Real broad range at this point. Then we narrow it down. We start looking at those plans, developing some systems and some cost estimates with everything. We started at about 7.1 and shaved it down to that 6.0. As we got towards the end, we looked at potential uh, items such as solar and then the contingency factors and things like that to make sure that this budget at bid day will be sufficient. So that's where we came up with five and a half or six and a half million. Show a little bit of the process. So this entire process probably takes at least four months to get there and through multiple plan revisions. Project timeline. So for those who haven't been involved from about 2016 to 2018, the Cambridge Fire and EMS started doing, our EMS Commission started doing some research, tours, site evaluations, and really evaluating their long range options for this facility or a potentially different facility. 2019 to 2020, Keller was brought on board. This is when we're going through that needs assessment, preliminary plans, <coughs> gathering all the information, really evaluating what options we have. So by the end of this phase, we were looking at the plans that you see before us with the budget we have, with a really firm game plan for the communities. Um, it's one of those things where it's a chicken and the egg. Um, it doesn't ma quite make sense to show the community halfway done plans or a concept. We have to come up with a solution that works and then present it to the community and get their feedback from that. So 2020, that's where we are today, getting the feedback and getting the community um, educated on everything that's happened and the road ahead. So this is informational meetings, media, community engagement meetings, and really just educating the public um, so that everyone feels informed about what, is, what exactly is going on. 2021, we would have that vote. Uh, if everything went well with the vote, that would lead into construction documents which would lead into bidding in approximately a year from now. So next winter-ish, which is the most ideal time to bid, which was driven specifically for this to save on the most, um, bid it out in the fall or the winter of next year. So then break ground in spring of 2022. And since the phasing, we would wrap it up in 2023 for project completion. Now granted, it's only 2020 right now, but currently, as fast as we're moving, <coughs> um, we wouldn't be moved in until 2023. So in conclusion, looking at the bigger picture, throughout the project, uh, the cost was the biggest driving factor as long, as well as staying on site and reusing that existing building. Uh, the solution that we're presenting is a long-range solution. It is not a temporary fix. It is not a Band-Aid. This is a 50-year solution for the communities. This solution supports the current staffing model. So we have a little bit of a mix with the EMS and the fire, which is volunteer. Looking down the road, no one can say exactly what the future will bring, but this solution makes sure that every potential solution with the staffing will work. It really accommodates the needs in the future. We looked at the long range planning of the size of this facility, how many people would be in there, and the, this is the best that we could come up with for the future. Now, we can't build a building that's going to be 100 years from now because no one knows what it's going to be. But when we look in the long range plan of that 50 year, if the community grew a substantial amount, this is typically where fire and EMS looks at adding another station. You know, no different than a Madison, where if they have massive development for five to 10 years, they would look at potentially adding an additional station. Um, and this would be the, 
you know, station number one or their main station. Cost per taxpayer. So the Cambridge Fire and EMS Commission brought or has me present this information, which was presented to me from them. So I'm here presenting it. This is the information that I was given. Um, this information is preliminary at this point. It was not driven by a financial advisor. Reason being is that these are all based on 2019 valuations. So when that vote happens next year, you would want the 2020 evaluation so that everything is up to date. Currently, in the preliminary numbers, looking at Oakland, Cambridge, Rockdale, and Christiana, if you own a $100,000 home, approximate value, you would have an annual increase of around $50 to $60 per year for a 20-year period. If you live in Lake Mills, because um, the district only covers about 7% of Lake Mills, you'd be looking at an approximate increase of 3 to $5 per year for that 20 year. Cool. So I talked a lot. <laughs> so this is typically where we open it up to questions, comments, concerns, happy to answer everything that we can for you. Not everybody at once. <laughs> I'm only one guy. Yeah. Yes. Did I see two training areas, one with a television with some seats in front of it, and then another room with tables? Were there two different training areas? Yes and no. So there's a one large training area. So that would be the educational seminars. That would be the meetings. That would be where all the department members are. But at, in the earlier video, the EMS currently stays in an apartment across the street. So that other um, meeting area that you saw is more of a day room, uh, similar to a living room. So it's no different than an apartment across the street. They would have a TV and a wall for a living room slash kitchen area, the one that you saw probably at the end. That's more of a hangout room so that people can eat, they can relax while they're on shift, no different than the EMS does currently in that apartment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Fire or EMS? Uh, both. 616 last year. So oh, EMS, and there's additional fire. We had 169 fire calls last year. So how many calls would that be in 50 years <laughs> a day? About two and a half a day, right what they just said. So when we look at that, um, it's no different than looking at population. Based on the current growth, um, I don't think it would be, I don't know if we ever actually ran those numbers in 50 years. Because it's one of those things that no one has a crystal ball and can tell um, where there's going to be assisted livings, where there's going to be apartment complexes, you know, areas that have very high, or buildings that have very high call volume, it's tough to see. Now the building is sized, not necessarily for the calls, but for the district itself, that it could handle a very high frequency of those calls that if um, there was ex um, a lot of expansion and growth in the area. It would be able to hold that um, well into the future. I would estimate that it's about 10 percent per year. So in 10 years, it would be 100 percent. It'd be 1,200 calls, and that's really rough going. But I think in the last four years, we've had about a 10 percent increase. 2020 will be different. Our call volume is down. Uh, people just, you know, are being very careful about going to the hospital. Um, so it, it'll be like last year. I don't think we'll have that 10 percent. It's been typically 10, maybe a little more percent, but that's a conservative estimate. Okay. Um, I, I'm for the project. My only concern is that if there's lots of calls going out of the downtown, that's going to be di pretty disruptive to any downtown businesses. Well, the current location was driven uh, and feel free to chime in here, but uh, when we looked at other parcels and other opportunities to build new, um, none of those sites made sense for the best location. So relocating that site somewhere else um, pulled that um, facility far enough away that the call or the response time really decreased. So the current location was driven 
primarily by the fact that it's in the best location for the entire district. Anything to add to that? We looked at a property on 12 and 18 going out of, out of the village. And for that, um, you know, part of Oakland that we have is way south, southeast. And uh, to get over to Daniels, Danielson, or to get over to Highway A, from that location would take extra three minutes, four minutes, because the, the um, volunteers that are coming, the firefighters coming, and Terry can address this, are coming through town to get out to that site, and then they're going with the apparatus back through town to, to get to Oakland um, or to Rockdale. Being in the center of town um, is pretty centrally located. Of course, uh, we haven't experienced with the ambulance any, you know, we're in and out, we get out of there pretty quick. We have lights and sirens. We'll probably have, uh, you know, some indicators on Highway 12 when we build this. If we build this, we'll put indicators. But uh, we're not on the road very long. <clears throat> yes? Um, I, I think you make a good case for the station. The only question I get is you provided a couple examples of uh, other stations that you're building. I think the most recent one was the town of Freedom. And you said that was, I think, 15,000 square feet? Correct. How does the size of this station compare to communities of similar size? I think Freedom's about 5,800 people. Um, I guess I just want to understand how does our proposal compare? So Freedom is right around, yep, that 5,800. Um, they do get mutual, so Freedom is a pretty small community. They get mutual aid from uh, Grand Chute. I don't know if you're familiar with the area. So they get uh, mutual aid from Grand Chute. They, Grand Chute's got the ladder trucks. They got everything they need. Um, as far as comparability to um, Cambridge, so Fort Atkinson, um, that station would have been larger. Um, it's at 23,000 square feet. And the reason it's at 23,000 square feet is we couldn't build another inch in any direction. Uh, we're just jam packed on a block and we just couldn't expand anymore. Um, same situation as this expansion. So that is 23,000. Um, that covers the city, which is right around that 11,000 um, residents. So then we look at um, Greenville. Uh, that's up in the Appleton, I'm from the Fox Valley Appleton area. So Greenville is a similar size to Fort Atkinson, um, but it's much more condensed. You have a larger population. It's not as rural as uh, Cambridge that needs all the equipment. That station was right around the six and a half to seven million that just got finished. And I wanna say, I don't have, actually I do. Oh, I did not bring it. So I want to say that's right around the 12 to 15,000 residents. I don't know exactly. Suamico, that is just wrapping up construction. That's in the Green Bay area. That is around 14 to 15,000 people. Again, fairly condensed uh, municipality. And I want to say that was almost 30,000 square feet. So when we look at this station, and the amount of residents and the district, um, how large it is, I think comparatively, it really makes sense. So when we look at something like Toma, that's 35,000 square feet, um, that's fully EMS and fire staffed all the time. And granted, it's just for the city, and it's not a huge district, but they have a lot of people um, for that, for the dense population. Now, when we look at um, the buildings, Toma is a pretty fancy building. Um, and then we look at um, Cambridge, Fort Atkinson, um, right in that more practical range. Um, and then we look at the Freedom Iron Ridge. Um, Freedom Iron Ridge are no different than a public works garage building. It's a steel building, simple, practical. Um, Economical is the best way to put it. Um, I mean, just for Cambridge, the reason there is masonry on the building is driven by the uh, village ordinance. Originally, to try to save on costs, we wanted to just have a steel structure, make it as most economical as we could. Um, but the 
masonry was driven by the village. So there's a lot of cost cuts, but in um, the bigger picture, I think we're right in the center of a practical building. Can I ask a question? Sure. I have, I have a question. Um, I don't live here, but I work here, so this is this would affect me in certain ways. But um, when you talked about the bidding process, you talked about individual bids for for you know for the the land the landscaping and the masonry and the electrical and all that stuff, and that's I think that's great. But my question is is would each municipality have to approve that bid? Because I'm I'm thinking of it from like if we were to build something here, the town board would approve it, and then we just go do it. How sure. would that work in this situation? And is it something like you have to go five for five? Does everybody have to approve it? If is it, does it, what happens if you only go four for five or three for five? Or how, how does that work? So typically, what happens is you know we get our ninety nine or however many bids we get. I go back. We review every single bid. We look um, through a pre qualification statement. So the low bid is not necessarily the bid that you're going with. Pre qualification statement, which goes through. Um, how many employees, banking references, uh, previous jobs, your vendors, all these individual items. So that we go through vet every subcontractor to make sure that they're qualified to work on your project. Um, do we see red flags? Yes, we do. We typically see one per project. Um, it's not all the time. There's some projects that are perfect, but um, we're looking out for the best interest of the municipalities. So then we would present that to the um, Fire and EMS Commission, and ultimately they make that deciding um, choice on those subcontractors. Typically, uh, we're, we're here to make a recommendation, they make the final say. Now, there may be some that I say, hey, um, this contractor is okay, but I will say that we've had problems with scheduling, and uh, you know they're typically non-responsible um, and a variety of other things, if um, they had issues with bonding and things like that, we'd present that, and the municipalities would make that final determination, but from our discussions, that um, Fire and EMS Commission would then approve that for that total project cost. So that would be different than the funding, which would be driven next spring. So next spring would be the funding, so we have the, the cost of the project, and then in the fall, the bidding, and as long as the bidding falls within that cost, then it would move forward. So essentially, I just want to make sure I understand you because I'm not sure that I did. So what you just said is, is that what, uh, we'll presume for the moment that all the referendums pass. Yep. So we'll go with that. But presuming that happens, essentially the fire commission would be speaking on behalf of all five municipalities if, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but I, I could maybe see Cambridge saying, we don't like that one, we don't want to pay for it, it's too expensive. Would, would any of the municipalities have that opportunity, or is, is like the fire commission has the final say and that's it? Well, all the municipalities are bound within the state the statutes right. of going with the low bid responsible. Okay. So as far as arguing, I don't I mean typically, as long as they're responsible, there's no reason not to go with the low that's, bid. That's why we have an intergovernmental agreement that creates a commission. The commission is the is the customer. commission's the decision maker. So, okay, so so they would so the commission is essentially it then. Yes, works for me. Oh, good answer. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. How, yeah. how, so it's going to go to referendum, right? Yes. The project itself. So what happens if one of the townships don't approve it through a referendum, or two, or whatever? How does that work? We're going to uh, recommend doing a. Uh, uh, non-binding ref referendum. Yeah, what does that mean? I don't... Uh, 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 you can do a binding referendum if you're a taxing district, district like the school is. We are not, the, the fire commission is not a taxing district. The town is. And the town is the one that has to make the decision on safety and all that stuff. So the <clears throat> referendum that would be non-binding that you run, if, if one of the communities decided, you know, that the vote, votes weren't there, uh, the municipal government would have to make the decision whether they're going to go forward with it or not. So the township could overrule the referendum vote? Certainly. The referendum's non-binding because we're not a taxing district. 
So then the we'll referendum would be advisory. Advisory, yeah. Okay. Well, that explains it. Then. Advisory. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Public safety. Right. Right. I mean. Yes. Um, kind of a question, I guess, just a comment. Um, I guess just firstly, I wanted to thank you for having these public meetings. You're this very welcome. Extremely um, comprehensive this evening. Thank you for all of you. Um, and because up until this time, and I certainly thank the Cambridge newspaper because that's how I've gotten my information during the past year. And I did talk with um, Jean on some things a while back also. But um, as a resident of the town of Oakland, um, I'm just very grateful for the fire and EMS department. I mean, that's, you guys are our lifeline to, um, I mean, emergency situations. And um, uh, I mean, when you look at the timeline of how long you have been working on this project and the goals that the commission had and how closely you met um, those goals and tried to keep the cost down, um, I it just, in very much in favor of the project, and um, I, I think it's the, in one of the newspaper articles it referenced the referendum that was brought up last spring, and there's no comparison. I mean, there's just not even. I mean, that's not even apples to oranges. It's even worse than that. I mean, that's we're talking life and death situations. We're talking about an emergency service compared to a. Um, it would be nice to have, you know, an arts building at the high school, you know, kind of on the wish list. I think this is way beyond the wish list. This is a tremendous need that, that our fire department and EMS has. And um, so just saying that I am very supportive. Of Thank the you very much. Thank you for Appreciate the comment. It. Thank you. Any other questions, mm -hmm. comments? Mm -hmm. If not, uh, thank you, Devin. You're welcome. Thanks to everyone coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Let you know that these videos are all on the website, the fire department website, and the Cambridge EMS website. And the Town of Oakland website. And the Town of Oakland website. CambridgeVFD.com. So Cambridge Victor Frank David VFD.com is a lot of contact information on there. Um, I'm certainly willing to give man. anyone in here or any, anybody that you know a tour of the station. Uh, they just have to contact me. I'm more than happy to uh, give the station to show what uh, it looks like at this time. Uh, any discussions I would certainly like to have. That video for me on the, on the EMS side is CambridgeAreaEMS.com. And um, my phone number is available. It's 423-3511. Uh, be glad to show you around the EMS. And answer any questions, you can call or you can make an appointment. I'd be glad to show you around. Did you all get the uh, letter that went out a few weeks ago with the information, the fact sheet, and, and uh, the rendering? No. Should have. Yeah. That information's on our website also. But we also have copies here if you want one tonight. Kill sure. we'll yeah. yeah. we'll they're, they're bothering me, not you. No, I think that's, I say it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so. Too slow. Got that one. Uh, it went out as a, as a postal patron, but we put on their, you know, fire EMS uh, expansion uh, information. But you know how that is. You get a lot of junk mail, and that's why we put that on there. Anybody need one that didn't get one? A woman over here. Hey, uh, Chris, did you get the 2% money yet? I did. I owe you a check. Okay. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Anybody else? We got plenty to spare. Okay. There you go. Uh, any other public comment on, on any item not on the agenda? Okay, we'll proceed with the meeting. Thanks, Terry. Okay. You guys need the projector for tomorrow? Uh, Bob does. You're going to take it, right, Bob? Or 
Actually, Bob, I can take the projector because I'll be at that meeting. Well, we thought we'd set it up. Oh. Uh, at 8.30 to make sure. Is there any tricks to it? Or? Just plug it in, turn it on. That's what they all say. We want to, we'll set it up at 8.30 and make sure it's okay. Okay. This didn't include a projector in your referendum, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's in there. I didn't know you, I didn't know you guys had one. Do have a media room? No, we're just going to rent ours to them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll put that in there. It's Jimmy, theirs. Jimmy, this is, this is the commission meeting. It's, it's, I'm the one that needs the, the projector tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I thought maybe Christiana had one. You bet. Yeah. Thanks for not our district. Um, I'll take care of you. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. I'll plug it. So well, yeah, bring it right can, back. Give it to Chris in the morning. Rent it out and pay us rent for that. Okay, next item is Sorry. to uh, approve the minutes for the July 21st, 2020 meeting. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the July 21st, 2020 meeting. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And approval of the minutes from the August 4th special meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, it was Jimmy and Thomas. Uh, aye. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried. Bruce isn't here, so we'll go past uh, his report, road supervisor's report. Good evening. Uh, Give me an update on the salt shed. Talked to the contractor right before this meeting and they have a setback with the trusses. They were originally gonna come and start building next, next Monday. Yeah. Uh, the trust company they work with have had a COVID case, so now they're shut down for two weeks. As soon as they get fired up back up again, we're supposed to be getting our trusses, one of the first ones being made. They're they're estimating they'll be here September 1st and start building the walls. So. Did he talk to you, or did you talk to him about sliding doors as opposed sliding to Sliding door. Yes. Uh, he is looking at a company that specializes in making the barn style sliding doors that we're looking at. Um, there's a couple different track systems. One is a aluminum oxide so it won't rust and another one's possibly stain, stainless steel. They're gonna look at that and try to, whatever's gonna last the best, so. And once he has uh, an idea what the, that cost difference is, he'll let us know. Okay. But yeah. The roll up door is not cheap. I would. No, I would it, think it's we'd not. Probably be a wash, but maybe not. Um, Aren't they a lot more maintenance too? Or? Yes. Or a sliding door is gonna be fine. It's just gonna have to secure it more, so. Yeah. Has any of you had the opportunity to drive Island Lane or even in the parking lot to see that the black stuff I put down about a month and a half ago? Um, so far it's holding up and doing what I wanted it to do. We'll see what the winter brings in the spring. Um, it was a little more cost, uh, a little more, a lot more labor intensive, but all in all, it's, it's gonna cut down some costs for future road rebuilds and I drove Hope Lake Road and looked at that portion that you did with that uh, that'll be a good test out there because yes it's not yes. a big area it's smaller areas and yep see what the plow does with that this winter yes it seems to be it once it finally set it's pretty solid <coughs> stuff Did you do other roads too? Did you do a cedar? No, I just did Island and Hope Lake and a couple manholes on Blue Waters Pass. Okay, because it, it looked like something was done on Cedar Road. Maybe it was done last year and I just never <laughs> noticed. <laughs> I wanted to get the West Cedar because of some of them cross tracks, you know, um, they're supposed to help take that, that dip away. Uh, we just ran out of our, our material. Okay. Okay, I see you have a, an idea to recoat the 
shop floor. Yes. Uh, if any of you have been in the shop, you see where the salt has chewed up the surface of the concrete. It's uh, it's pitted it pretty bad over the years, just from dripping off the trucks. Um, this product will come. They'll come in. They'll fix all them spots with a leveling uh, compound, and then they do three coats. And it's, I believe in there it says a five-year warranty. Originally, they're lifetime warranties on garage on two-car garages. You know, garages that people uh, the homeowner has. But since we're more of a business type with bigger equipment, five-year warranty. Yeah. So they'll fix anything that peels up or or gets scraped up. So are we doing this over the new floor also? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this includes yes. sealing the new floor. Okay. Is this is this epoxy? Yes. So that not. Yep. How long are you gonna have to be out of the building? It's uh, they come in the morning and we can put stuff back in at the end of the day. Really? Yeah, oh, wow. with that size, they'll come in with three different crews, and it's it sets up in a day. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have thought you'd have to be out a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure it'll take us a couple of days to move everything out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably gonna be pretty fumey too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. right now yeah, I want to go back in and that at night. It. Yeah, neighbor had it done, and it was like three days yeah. before the of odor went away. Yeah, um, yeah my brother's gonna get that done. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I think it's the same company. Actually. But it is salt resistant, chemical resistant, so it won't deteriorate from that. Well, we're in that building now, what is it, 15 years? Pretty getting there, yep. Uh, and uh, the, if the concrete wouldn't have failed, yeah. probably would have came to, with, to this, you know, conclusion anyway because it was starting to pit really bad yeah well you had saw that when behind the trucks where yeah. it was by the doors and yeah i don't know what do you think i think it's pay now or pay us later i it's think it's course. yeah I, I i would agree yeah i think it's just gonna for some lengthen the life of the concrete concrete we yes. had it done to begin with and we probably wouldn't have this problem right probably entirely and we possible. talked about that when we first that yeah but it was technology's come a long way since yeah. so we're Products actually better what's the price of it fifteen thousand dollars fifteen thousand yeah yeah did, did you get this yeah when would they be able to do it i don't know they're booking up yeah, pretty fast that. but when he came and gave us that um he said he would have it done before the snow would fly but that's been a few weeks now so there it is yeah, 31st is when he sent this. I would move we accept the bid from TSR to seal the um, floor in the garage for $15,000. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second to approve the TSR concrete coating uh, quote of $15,000 to recoat the shop floor. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, the other thing you got on here is discussion of possible action on the pre wetting salt process for winter. Yes. We talked about that, I believe, in February. Yeah. This year. Don't know with everything going on if any of you, after we had talked, had a chance to. Do some of your own investigating or not? Or well, just, the county has been—it's been very successful for the county there. Yes. Um, matter of fact, they did not bid go in with the state salt bid this year. That's the first time ever. Oh, really? really? Yes. So I don't know oh. what they have up their sleeve, <laughs> <laughs> but obviously they have something. Jeff, did we did we check? Could we buy this from the county without having so we wouldn't have to build the or have the um, storage? The only thing is, it, I would have to go down there when they're available. Oh, okay. Yeah, he does the lake roads. Uh, yeah, early in the morning. And a couple so, of those. Yeah. Those okay. out roads uh, early before yeah. five o'clock in the morning. So. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All 
I think it's it's better for the you know the overall yes. ro roads and, and just the environment. I mean, I haven't I been since I started. I've been slowly cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. I'm at that point where I don't know how much more I can go without a little help. And if I can keep, if I can activate that the salt that is there faster, when you come back around, you're not plowing it off that it hasn't activated yet, and throwing it in a ditch because you scrape. You know, right. stuff off. You want to once it activates, it can get down to the surface and break that loose a lot. It's going to help. Quicker. It's going to help the watershed, the lake. It yes. It's yeah. just more healthy for for everything from everything I've seen on it so far. Yes. So we're not breaking new ground here. I mean, it's and it's been, been, been around a long time. Like you said, yeah. it has it's just it's starting to be more and more people are are going with it. Before it cost the environment wasn't wasn't a, a factor. Now it now it is starting to be. It looks to me like. Uh, just in salt savings alone, uh, it would be a four to five year payback. Mm -hmm. And that salt number? That's not going to stay at 86.25. No. <laughs> and the amount of tons we go through, yeah. most of that is around the lake Yeah. on that number. We just don't go through it out in the country. Yeah, it's seeming seems that uh, you know our most important asset being the lake that we ought to we ought to just do this it's do whatever it's we right can to take do. care of it yeah i mean if we didn't have the lake there we might have a little longer conversation right i'm for it i'd entertain a motion i will make the motion i will make a motion to um accept the pre-wedding salt process for winter i'll second it Okay, motion's made and seconded to uh, uh, have Jeff order the salt pre-wedding with the salt brine equipment uh, for this winter. Total cost looks like about $8,800. Yeah. Then we're January quotes, so we'll see yeah. what the COVID did to us on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Are we going to be able to put that in before the shed gets built? Or are we going to no, I'm going to work around that. I'm okay. going to try to make it cosmetically appealing. I don't know if that's the term for Ooh. it. but <laughs> Okay. I'm going to put lipstick on it. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. I don't know how long it's going to take to get the truck equipped because i got to send and up there and they're going to work it in okay. uh, there could be some more cost savings if our circuit board in the one truck they'll give us some credit for it if it's still you know usable because the okay. technology hasn't changed too much that way so okay good fingers crossed okay thanks jeff thank you kirk treasurer's report <clears throat> all right before we uh dive into the audit i just have a couple of quick updates um the election was a week ago tonight, we had 630 total voters. Um, of that, we had about 400 absentee ballots, so uh, about two thirds, and then the other 230 were in person. It was it was a good day. Um, it was there were a lot of flies in here at the end of the day because we had the doors open, but um, it was a really good day. Everything balanced at the end of the night. Um, we had some new people working in the morning and the afternoon. Um, so I didn't have a chance to train them, but they all did really well. We're going to have them back in November, assuming they can make it. Um, but it was, it was a good day. It was a busy day, but we, uh, we all survived. And uh, we are already getting calls about November and ballots for November. So um, I didn't think I was going to have to say this, but I will. Um, ballots will not be mailed out until we get them because we don't have them yet. Um, that will probably be mid to late September. Um, the process that's followed is because this is a federal election, um, we have to get those mailed out 47 days prior to November 3rd, which if, I, if my math is correct, I think it's September 18th, which means hopefully we would get them from the county a week or so prior to that to have time to get everything labeled and, and stuffed and ready to go. So um, the county has, uh, for those of you who got absentee ballots this year, whether it was in person or in the mail, the county is trying something a little bit different this year. They're um, pre-addressing all the envelopes for us, and they are all, we are also using their um, bulk mailing mm. 
So we're actually going to save five cents on postage for every ballot that we mail out. So we won't have to keep running to the post office and stamping them. And it's really going to speed up the process. Like, you know, when you do one or two ballots and go through the process, it's not that much. But when you do 600, it's a lot. So uh, it's going to save a lot. In, in the theme of efficiency and, and saving money, we're going to be a lot more efficient. And we're going to actually be saving some money in the end by going with the county on this. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we also have, uh, for those of you who get absentee ballots, we put in two sheets. One is the uniform absentee instructions, which are very long and cumbersome. By law, we have to do that. Uh, but then this year, um, I actually stole something from Sun Prairie that I got in my absentee ballot, highlighting the important areas that you need to sign. So sign your name, have your witness sign, have your witness address, because if all three of those aren't filled out, your ballot doesn't get counted, and nobody wants that. And so um, we need those pages <coughs> folded. Uh, I've been talking to Mary with the court, and uh, she has a couple of people who need to serve some community service. So we're going to get some free labor folding those. and stuffing those so I'm pretty stoked about that um, but if you are planning on voting we are having in-person absent we are having in-person voting on November 3rd uh, if you if you choose to get an absentee ballot request it now that way we have everything on file and we can just mail them all out in one big dump um, we all know the issues that the post office have been having um, and, and it's you see it in packages and letters so I just want to make sure that everybody's ballots get counted. Uh, ballots have to be back here by 8 o'clock on Election Day. So if anybody has any questions, if you have friends or family that have questions, um, please direct them to talk to me. This is maybe the most important part of my job is making sure that elections run smoothly and being that resource for everybody. And um, November will be my fourth presidential election and overall my 54th election. So I'm, I'm going to say I'm an expert. If you want to argue with me on that, that's fine. We, okay, we can have I will. <laughs> so, so, so that's that. Too. <laughs> um, on the property tax side, we actually... What about uh, poll workers? Oh, yes. Um, we, we do need poll workers. Um, Barb, I know, uh, I know that you were interested. I may ask you for November, but Tom beat you out. So thank you for uh, volunteering. Um, we might need some more. We usually run with five, but because this is a big election, um, we're probably going to run with seven. We might even run with nine. So um, I've had some people in the past couple days reach out to me and say, hey, we're interested in being poll workers. Richard has been a poll worker before. Um, he's awesome. So it's, it's just we're going to need the help. Um, they're paid positions. They're $11 an hour. Um, and you can either work a half day or a whole day. Um, from, from experience, a whole day is long. But, you know, it's, it's pretty sweet to be done at the end of the night. Um, but contact me or Susan in the office if you know anybody, if you want to, um, to the Best of my understanding, none of you are running for president of the United States in this room, so you can all serve as poll workers. Um, but again, if you have questions, let us know. Um, we're going to try and have some training probably late September, early October, um, maybe with a couple other municipalities in a socially distanced manner somewhere. But I don't know where that would be or when that would be, but I'll know more later. Um, so there's that. And then Shifting gears real quick on property taxes, we got our settlement check today from the county, and um, after what we have to um, cut to the sanitary district uh, for delinquent, special, delinquent um, sewer charges, we're actually very close to what we were collecting last year at this time. So um, I was concerned about people potentially not paying the second half of their taxes. Uh, that didn't happen. So financially, from based on what we got today, and it literally came today, uh, we're, we should be fine for sure for the rest of the year. Um, I, I breathed a little sigh of relief when that came, and we just did some quick calculations. But um, it looks like we didn't have a lot of issues financially from COVID and people not paying their taxes and that sort of thing. So um, that's good for everybody. Audit. All right, on to the audit. Um, the first thing that I need to, to tell the board is that uh, Jeff wanted me to convey, uh, Jeff is our, our main auditor from Johnson Block. Um, he's a little bit younger than me. He just had his second child. So um, first he wanted me to convey thanks for your patience. Um, thanks for your understanding. Their office has been uh, hit by COVID a little bit, but they're all working from home. They're all doing everything that they can. And so he apologized that uh, this is a couple of months late, uh, but, uh, I, I got this yesterday late in the day, so that's why uh, it didn't make it for your package for the weekend. So, um, but the process that we have is this is the draft audit. And so essentially, here we go. So essentially all we, all, what the board has to do 
is approve the draft tonight. Gene and I will sign the management letter, which I think I gave copies of each of you. Um, Gene and I will sign the management letter, and then I will send this management letter back to Jeff, and then the annual meeting, which was supposed to be tonight, but couldn't be because we didn't have uh, the draft already approved. The annual meeting will be in September, and I think the only thing on the agenda will be a couple of minutes to approve and to approve the annual audit. Other than that, there's nothing else. Um, so this is a draft. Um, it looks pretty similar to last year. Uh, we're, we're in, as, as best as I understand it, we're in uh, good financial shape. There are some areas to improve as far as like internal controls and like a credit card policy and um, delineation of duties, but uh, overall, um, Jeff and I had a really good talk about how everything is going and, and, and you know, being kind of adjusting to taking over from the prior staff. Um, and, and I personally, me, I'm in a much more um, understanding spot than I was a year ago at this time and understanding where things are and how things are um, uh, kept record-wise and stuff like that. So um, I can't answer a whole lot of questions in terms of the actual audit because I didn't have a whole lot of time to look at it. but. Um, if you have any, you could certainly ask and, and I can get you the answer uh, in the future, in the near future. But that's kind of the scoop and I, I think Jeff called you and asked you the same questions he asked me and mm -hmm. I, would, I would presume everything went well. Um, yes, and I, <laughs> I went through the uh, draft audit, uh, both pieces today, and I really didn't see any problem in any of it. Very similar to last year. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a couple, like you said, a couple areas where we can improve on the internal operations, but that isn't anything that has a bearing on finances. Sounds like there's some su supporting documentation that we need to yeah. make sure that we have. Right. Uh, on payments. I've been through that. I audited our church for the last several years. Oh. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> you would know. Happens more than you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable um, because we've. I didn't have that much time to really look at this today. Um, I would like, if we're going to approve this tonight, I would like us to have on the agenda the management letter with the recommendations for a later discussion um, to look at those because a couple of those are are good points made to us and um, and supporting documentation. Well, so I think, I, yeah, I think our duty is to take that information and act on it. Right. That's, and that's what we need to do. Uh, uh, there's right. three items that I saw in there that it's, right. it's a matter of policy that we have. And uh, that's why I just would like it scheduled for discussion on a, on a meeting. You mean a, a schedule to do that? You mean to put it yes. on, the, on the agenda to do? Yes. Okay, well, I asked Chris to look at that and see what he and I can talk about what we might recommend, and then we can put it on next month's agenda. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I just don't want us to put it on a shelf and forget about it. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens too. Yes, yes it does. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the draft uh, audit from Johnson Block. I'll second that. Okay, motion's made and seconded to approve the draft audit from Johnson Block. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, next item. Uh, discussion possible action regarding operator's license for William Zabel, Jessica Holmes, Jennifer Steinhorst, Dane Jensen, and Olivia Williams. Just a point of order on the, the William Zabel, there is no business no listed. Business. Yeah, I noticed that too. No, she listed. I didn't know if he was temporarily doing it or what. I looked at yeah. that too. Yeah, I. 
do they have to have a business on there? I, I, I don't, don't, I don't, don't think, think so. they I do. I think you can, you can get a bartender's license if you, if you get the, the not school. You pass the class. You pass okay. the class. Maybe you get a bartender's a license. Right and, Maybe he's not working and just wanted to get the license. Yeah. Go find it. I, I just don't know. Um, I was wondering that too because I thought yeah, paint like, yeah. 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 Both of them were blank. I, I don't know what, um, I didn't have a chance to contact him because I, I missed that that was missing. Um, but I don't know what, um, other than that, he, I mean, all, he met all the qualifications. Yeah. I don't think that has a bearing on whether or not he's employed or not. Yeah. I, I mean, you can choose to, you can choose to um, postpone it to next month and, you know, wait till then, and I can give him a call and be like, "What's going on?" Or um, you can approve it or deny it. It's it's not. You don't have to. You don't have to act on it if if you don't want to. I think probably he's paying for an operator's license, and if he wants to, and it costs money. We have yeah. to take it, and he can work wherever he wants. I don't well, think plus, it plus probably the, doesn't matter. Plus the uh, license itself is not. You know, you have to pay for that as well. Mm -hmm. so. Right, and it doesn't. It, it, you can work any place with a license. They right? say it's Point. transferable yeah. to anywhere. Yeah. Okay. That that question, I, I've 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 toyed with the idea of re removing that question mm -hmm. from the license because it almost is irrelevant. I mean, it's it helps me with filing it, but do we need that? Not really. Well, we always got in the habit of doing it simply because <clears throat> many times the employer is the one that paid the fee. Yeah. Right. So you had a check from the employer. Yep. And <clears throat> I'm okay with it. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the operator's license for William Isabel, uh, Jessica Holmes, Jennifer uh, Steinhorst, Dane, Dane Jensen, and Olive, uh, Olivia Williams. I'll second. second it. Okay, motion's made and seconded to approve the operator's license for uh, William Isabel, Jessica Holmes, Jennifer Steinhorst, Dane Jensen, and Olivia Williams. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Did everybody get a chance to go through the employee handbook? Handbook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I yeah, did. Maybe. A lot of it's clarification and yeah. Yeah. changing and from town clerk to clerk treasurer yeah. and all that stuff. There's. I, I just wanted to give a real quick overview. I, I didn't. I didn't expect this to get approved tonight. First of all, so. Um, if you approve it tonight, that's great, but that was not my expectation. Um, so there's, there's one, uh, I guess, outside of the clarifications, there's a lot of just kind of grammatical stuff. And um, when, like, for example, when Ted and I went through Susan's job description, removing the word typewriter and replacing it with computer, uh, there, there's a lot of that. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's in there. Um, there's a couple. The one big thing, if you go to the very last page, um, my and I'm only going to toot my own horn on this. Um, my my uh, public administration professors would be very proud of me. This is the uh, town organizational chart. It's in color. It looks pretty. Everybody should have one. I checked with Chief just to make sure the structure of his police department was correct. Um, but everything else is on this organizational chart. And I don't. I mean, unless there's a commission or something that's created, that should probably be the same for many many years. Um, but it's very simple, but it's really good to have on paper just to refer to that. Um, the other kind of big highlights, um, there was a question that, that Susan and I both toyed with, um, is the accrual of sick time, and does that start on a, on a, on a January 1st basis or an anniversary basis? And that's not in here. So for me... Should be anniversary. It, well, for me, I don't care what it is, to, to be honest. I really don't. For me, I, I was hired in January, so it almost is, you know, for me, it's not a big deal because it's January. But for Susan, who started in August, it, I, I just don't know what it is. Um, you, you don't give her vacation to go back in January, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. This will be going forward. Yeah, well, then she's losing out. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah no. That's why I'm saying it should be... Uh, and, and I mean, I, I came from, from a, when I worked, I mean, when I worked at Blooming Grove, I worked there for 10 years. In Blooming Grove, we had, it was the first of the year, everything, not, I don't want to say reset, but that's when you got your vacation and your sick time and your personal time. So I, I, there is no right or wrong answer. I just need to know what you guys want just so we can yeah. have it consistent. Um, and then the other thing, um, the uniforms, 
It, and this really was more uh, effect. This is on page 15. Um, the uniforms really this mostly affected the police department than anything else. Um, I talked with Chief about um, what had happened a few years ago when, you know, and I wasn't here for it, but when you had to work a certain amount to get a certain amount, and then the board changed that policy to make just kind of a, a pot of money available and Chief to dole that out as he saw fit. And so I wanted to make sure that um, everything was kosher as far as he was concerned with that. Uh, so that policy now exists in here. And then the other, not definitely not controversial policy, but a policy that the board has had but wasn't in the handbook was uh, the payout of vacation. Uh, if you guys remember when Lori mm -hmm. departed uh, over a year ago, we paid, it, it wasn't a lot of vacation, but she had some vacation hours left over that the board paid out. That was never in the handbook, so now that's in here. Um, but if you have any, if, if you have any questions, um, if you want to take it home and digest it and look at it, these are all the changes that Joy had when she did what she did. Nice job, by the way. These are all the suggestions and changes that Susan and I, when we talked about it, that we had. It looks really messy, but I promise you when it's all said and done, it's going to be shortened by like, you know, six to maybe ten pages. So um, that's another thing is just really tightening it up and, and making it a lot easier to, to read. We both said when we were done, when this is a clean copy, we could probably do this whole process again and make it even tighter. We won't, but we could. So um, I, I'm open to whatever you guys want to do. Uh, but like I said, my expectation was I tell you what I tell you, you take it home, you look at it, and then we can pass it in November and have more of a, uh, a deep conversation about things that you guys find out. But it, um, whatever you guys decide is fine with me. I think you're wrong about it. it I, I knew there was a paragraph in here that says, you are eligible to use sick time after three months of employment. Mm -hmm. After six months, your sick time uh, will accumulate retroactively from your date of hire. OK. <coughs> Where'd you find so, that? Okay. Uh, page, page 17, 17. second paragraph. I'm glad you found that because I didn't know that was in there. Yeah, I, I saw that today and I okay. thought it was in there. I, you know, my thought is I'd like not to adopt this tonight because we had numerous discussions and, and I have copies with all kinds of notes on that I didn't have time to go dig out of the file today. And I'd like to, I highlighted a couple things that I'm questioning um, in here, and I'd like to have the opportunity to go look at those. Because um, we've spent, gosh, what, well, four or five this is, this is, you know, been real high on our, on our list of things to do because we've only been doing this for a year, so. Oh, excuse, <laughs> sir, excuse me. We've been doing this for two and a half years. Yeah, I'll let <laughs> No, excuse me, we haven't been doing it. <laughs> we've yeah. been giving it lip service. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I okay, just had I four comments. I hope I remember to bring it in next time. But they're, I would they're small. suggest we uh, we take this up at our September meeting, yeah. And so everybody gets a chance to review it and make any comments. Uh, and if you got comments in the meantime, get them into Joy or, or excuse me, into uh, Susan or Chris. You can have them ready for the meeting. You can have them ready for the okay. meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Ask a question. Are you ready to? Sure. Go ahead. Is this a revamp? Is this the, the handbook that you're doing? Is it a revamp of an old one? Yes. Oh, okay. We did one, gosh, 15 years ago, maybe? 2008. Oh, 2008. Yeah, 2008. Okay. 12 years ago. Okay. And is there going to be any, is there any resident input? Is there any, like a resident committee or anything that looks at that? No. No. Before you guys? No. This is a, this. Do you think that maybe it should be available to the public to take a look at? No, not it's not an really. employee I mean, handbook. It's a, it's a the residents uh, vote us, and that's the, when you look at the org chart. That's that's the deal. That's my opinion. I, I would I would actually I would agree with that. Uh, the residents, and it actually I, I did put this on the org chart. I know you can't see it, but the top square on here is residents. So the board reports to the residents, and then the rest of us employees report to these five people. But so. The job descriptions aren't in here. No. no. This is just a handbook. The job descriptions are totally separate. Ah. It's behavioral. I thought it included. No, no, this, no, no, no. This Those is, are separate. This is more behavioral uh, vacation. Administrative. Administrative. Stuff. Exactly. Management. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, Correspondence, we've got the court dockets uh, and the planning committee minutes. Next item then would be approval of disbursements. I'll make a motion that we approve disbursements uh, beginning with check number 41445 through and including electronic funds transfer number 325. 48594 in the aggregate amount of $149,745.25. I'll second. Se second. Okay, motion made and seconded <coughs> to approve disbursements in the, in the amount of $149,745.25. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Next meeting date, September 15th. And we're going to do the annual meeting then? Annual meeting, we should be ready with that. Yep. Okay. We aren't the only ones that are oh, waiting until now. Uh, Lake Mills, Hope told me they're going to try to get theirs. They haven't got their audit back yet, but they're going to try to do theirs uh, first Tuesday in September when we have our presentation night. Can mm -hmm. uh, we just get that one? What's that? That meeting? Oh, I'll be there for the presentation, but then I'm going to skip the rest of it. <laughs> Just like I did last night at Rockdale. There you go. Are we going to start the annual meeting at 7 or 6.30 or? Well, we, I mean, we can do it at 7 and then I'll, I can just post it as the board, the board meeting will follow immediately oh, after yeah. the conclusion of the annual meeting. Oh, 